As the Chinese Communist Party celebrates its centennial anniversary this year, how do China's leaders view the world? Can foreign businesses post-COVID-19 continue to thrive in a country that, on the one hand, is responsible for such a large share of current and future global economic growth, but on the other hand, actively pursues policies of self-reliance? And as the European public and politicians grow more critical of China's human rights record, will continuing doing business with China hurt their interests at home? From Studio HESS in The Hague, today we talk to David Rennie, Beijing Bureau Chief at The Economist, who speaks on a regular basis to both Chinese Communist Party officials and European representatives of European businesses in China to find answers. My name is Joris Teer. I am strategic analyst at the Hague Center for Strategic Studies, focusing on Chinese foreign policy. So when we last spoke, I think about 10 months ago, uh, this was sort of the height of the COVID-19 pandemic and the geopolitical situation around it. I asked you, why does China pick a fight with 60% of the world economy at once? And you said, and I quote, China's leaders believe they are delivering an educational dose of pain, which teaches governments, particularly those of American allies, that it's time to take China very seriously. So today I ask you, have they been successful? Are they being taken more seriously? I think they are. And I think in some ways that's clearly working for them. And I think their strategy remains basically that at the end of the day, everyone is driven by fear and greed uh, more than they are driven by love. And so, you know, we live in a bleak world in which strength is the most important factor. I think they still believe that. And I think they are still picking on American allies, uh, whether it's Canada or Australia or uh, sanctioning the European Union in ways that we think are clumsy and uh, self-harming, uh, but which they think are smart. And I think in terms of one goal, which is to make us fear China and to understand that China offers opportunities that we cannot afford to ignore, so fear and greed, I think that message comes through loud and clear so they can sort of say that that's a win. The problem is, though, that I think they're probably wrong if they completely dismiss, uh, if not love, at least the idea of trust. And I do think that if countries are now perhaps, particularly in Europe, uh, increasingly kind of in despair at the idea of ever changing China's course or trying to contain China and certainly, you know, wary of joining an alliance of Western countries to try and challenge China. At the same time, they are much, much more concerned about the direction of China's uh, kind of politics and this kind of bullying, uh, this willingness to use China's strength and its market power. And I think you're seeing uh, much more really concrete discussions in Europe about defensive measures. To uh, to borrow a phrase from a French sinologist, François Godemont, he has this nice phrase about the need to China-proof our economies and our values. And I think that work um, is continuing in, in really interesting ways. And I think that's the flip side of the aggression that China thinks is teaching everyone a useful lesson. Well, fear and bullying, obviously, works a lot better if the other party is dependent on you. And uh, in the last, since we last spoke again, um, this new term has been introduced called dual circulation. And I was wondering whether you could explain to us what it is and why Western, but especially European firms, uh, should care about its consequences. They definitely should. And I think that it's an extension of uh, a previous discussion which worried people in the West about China wanting to seek self-reliance uh, in a range of really high-end technologies and sectors. And that desire for self-reliance, or what China sometimes used to call indigenous innovation, was often heard in places like Washington DC as basically China planning to steal as much Western technology as it could, uh, invite Western companies into China with the promise of markets sort of access transfer as much of their technology as they could. And then through things like the Made in China 2025 program, uh, they got so much attention a couple of years ago, the idea was that China would kind of get strong in these fields and basically throw the foreigners out. The dual circulation theory that you correctly say is now, you know, 
described in, in some detail, uh, including by the top leader, Xi Jinping, um, is a sort of an extension and an explanation of how self-reliance uh, can combine with a, an economic model within China, uh, which is uh, much more about relying on China's domestic consumer economy to drive future growth. So the old discussion, which already got people in the West worried, was that China's view of openness to globalization uh, was changing, that China was less and less uh, really interested in thinking in the very long term about long term equal relationships and partnerships with the West, that the idea was just take our technology and then throw us out. That was the old concern. It's now been joined by a more kind of domestic concern that China is increasingly convinced that the most sustainable and in, in some ways the safest source of future growth is going to be based on Chinese domestic consumption with foreign growth and foreign trade as a kind of nice add-on that brings with it useful investment and useful markets, but that fundamentally China needs to look to its own extraordinary market power to drive its own growth. And there was a very useful speech uh, that Xi Jinping gave to uh, senior level officials at ministerial level and provincial leaders uh, in January, on January the 11th, describing this new development paradigm, drawing on the dual circulation theory. It was then published in full in the leading theoretical journal of the Communist Party, Chiushu, uh, and that's, this happened last month, an incredibly useful document, not very long, but full of really concrete examples. In particular, Xi Jinping told a story about how last year, the height of the COVID pandemic, he made a study tour of one of the big coastal uh, provinces, Zhejiang, that is you know, extremely open to globalization, was one of the pioneering provinces of reform and opening up. And he saw that some of their most important supply chains had been interrupted by COVID supply difficulties, and that this had caused real disruption in the economy of Zhejiang. And that this, he said, had made him rethink the entire kind of reform and opening view of uh, China growing rich and strong on the back of global supply chains that had kind of that sourced important materials overseas and sought important markets overseas and then were as open to uh, to uh, sort of imports and exports as possible that kind of export led growth model of the 1980s 1990s and 2000s and he cited this famous Chinese phrase about having both heads uh, outside Liang Tao Wai and then Da Jian Da Chu in great number of imports, great number of exports. And that that paradigm no longer feels appropriate in a world where globalization is being unrolled by uh, populist politicians overseas and where, and he didn't mention Donald Trump, but that was clearly at the back of his mind, where China found itself vulnerable, not just economically, but even in terms of national security, to what he called technology choke points, forms of high technology, semiconductors, you know, the kit that makes semiconductors, for instance, um, that America still has a lead in, and America is willing to use to choke off supplies that Chinese champions need to, you know, continue and fuel their rise uh, to global dominance. And that idea that China is getting richer and stronger, but is still vulnerable to certain key technologies that America can choke off is now clearly unacceptable to Xi Jinping. And as a result, he is willing to posit a kind of a double vision, a double message from China that China is still open to the world where it suits China, but is not interested in being dependent on the world for anything that is crucial to China's economic or national security. So I, I mean, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it because I actually had a question for you about these two stories. I mean, will China will uh, celebrate with great fanfare the, uh, the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party this year. And in a recent column you wrote um, that in some ways this year made you think of 1949 when as well uh, Mao Zedong, then the founder of the, well, the founder of the People's Republic of China at the time, said, told one sort of soothing uh, story to a more international audience, but at the same time, a deeply, deeply political story uh, domestically. And you said that that reminded 
that those events remind you of the events today. Um, so can you explain what these two stories are and which story is closer to the truth of how Chinese leaders really see the world? So if you go back to 1949, the founding year of the People's Republic of China, the, the, the Communist Party had a, had a problem because in order to enthuse and motivate ordinary Chinese to join this revolution, they had to explain that it was going to change everything. That if you currently did not have land, if you were at the bottom of society, if you were a worker who felt oppressed, everything was going to change. There was going to be a revolution and there was going to be a gigantic redistribution of wealth, of land and of property. But the very young, fragile People's Republic of China still needed some members of the old status quo to stick around at least for a while. So they didn't want every single industrial boss and every single foreign investor to leave immediately straight after the 1st of October 1949. So they had this double message, as you say, to their own supporters. They told this very radical story about uh, gigantic redistribution of wealth and social power. But to the existing status quo establishment, those members who they felt could be co-opted and persuaded to stick around for a while were told a story about how China needed their patriotic support, needed their technology, needed their investments, was going to remain open to the world, that China would be pragmatic, that its, its job was to get rich and strong and to feed its people rather than really focus on politics. And that double message very quickly came unstuck. And some of the big Chinese industrialists and foreign investors who did stay, or in some tragic cases, were persuaded to return to China soon after the revolution in 1949, ended up within a couple of years more or less losing everything, either volunteering in inverted commas to give their companies to the Chinese state or, or just being kind of thrown in jail and having their property expropriated. Now, there are not, you know, Red Army troops about to take away General Motors factories uh, or confiscate, you know, uh, you know uh, BASF chemical plants. We're not at that point. But I do think that this year, which is the 100th centenary uh, year of the founding of the Communist Party, uh, with July the 1st being the exact date, uh, which will be a gigantic kind of domestic propaganda uh, sort of extravaganza, they have the same problem, which is that they need to tell a story to the public in China about how, you know, they have this phrase about, you know, without uh, the Communist Party, there would be no new China, that for all of the kind of twists and turns that communist rule took, particularly in the sort of the worst days of Mao, that fundamentally, if you are Chinese and you're proud of China being strong and advanced today and having aircraft carriers and nuclear missiles that can hit American cities and to be able to land spaceships on the surface of Mars, that all of that uh, rejuvenation, all of that return to China's natural place at the top of the kind of uh, table of great powers, that all of that was absolutely sort of inseparable from 70 years of continuous Communist Party rule over the People's Republic of China. And so that extremely political message, talking as you know, we hear from Xi Jinping and other leaders about the need to transmit the kind of the red revolutionary fire to next generation, the need to have more political uh, education in you know, nursery schools, primary schools, universities, workplaces, uh, the need to encourage red patriotic tourism. Uh, you know, there are, are, you know, dozens of former Communist Party bases, uh, sort of scenes of battles and long march kind of defeats, uh, which at the moment are absolutely heaving with tour groups often dressed in kind of the pale blue kind of replica uniforms of the Eighth Route Army. You know, you see these kind of, you know, dozens and dozens of slightly overweight Chinese officials dressed as Red Army soldiers from the 1930s, kind of puffing their way around these red tourism sites and singing revolutionary songs. It's a very, very political uh, revolutionary message. But at the same time, somewhat like 1949, they still want foreign technology. They still want foreign investments. Uh, you know, for instance, uh, their stated goal to uh, make the Chinese economy net carbon neutral by 2060, China on its own does not have that technology. It's going to need it from places like the European Union. And it needs companies to believe that China is the best source of future growth for them and that it is a reliable, 
and stable partner and that it's worth investing the next billion euros or 10 billion euros in building a state-of-the-art plant somewhere in China to service the China market and maybe export markets too. But that message has to coexist with this very political, very nationalist message, not just about the strength of the Communist Party and the importance of party rule, but also about, as we said before, you know, self-reliance and China not wanting to, to be dependent on the West. And really to boil it down to the kind of the core double message, China's leaders have at various times over the last 12 months given speeches in which they have essentially said, in order for China to have the economic power to deter foreign countries from picking a fight with China or defying China's wishes, China has to make sure that as many foreign countries and companies as possible are dependent on Chinese markets and Chinese growth. But at the same time, China must not be dependent on any foreigner for anything that is crucial to China's national or economic security. And that kind of double message of, we need you to be dependent on us, but we have no intention of being dependent on you, isn't great for countries' long-term trust that China is just another big economic giant that is going to fit into the existing world order in ways that are basically benign and not disruptive. The disruptive effects of China's rise are becoming increasingly clear. But at the same time, China's story about being where the growth is, is extraordinarily potent. And especially after a year of COVID laying waste to consumer demand in the West, you know, there are a lot of companies, particularly say European companies, uh, Asian companies, where their only unit that made any money last year was in China. And the profits <coughs> and the profits that those China units are sending back to their headquarters are in some cases kind of keeping the entire multinational corporation afloat. So China's market power has never been so visible. But companies' doubts about whether they are welcome in the long term have never been so acute. So, I mean, looking from the perspective of, of some of these European firms, um, given that, I mean, there are projections that 25 to, I think, 30 percent even of global growth will take place in China the, the, the upcoming years. How should their short term sort of business departments balance their interests with obviously longer term strategic requirements of not falling prey to uh, China's efforts to replace them in these indigenization efforts? So what I hear among European business leaders here in Beijing uh, and other cities is that a year ago, uh, particularly because COVID was showing the kind of the fragility of some very important supply chains, there was a lot of conversation about the need to hedge and to diversify and the risks of being too dependent on the China market. Now, with China really as the only growth story for lots of important European companies, I'm told that that conversation about diversification has basically ended, at least for now. You don't hear people talking about that because this is the only place that people can see revenue growth. And so I think that, you know, it's not that everyone has forgotten uh, some of the lessons, the painful lessons that they learned last year. It's that, you know, companies are in some ways forced to be uh, short term kind of all the time and can afford to be long term in their thinking some of the time. But, you know, if they're not hitting their results right now, if they're not keeping their shareholders happy right now, then they're in immediate trouble. And in the kind of short term, this is where the action is. And, you know, in the medium term, this is where the growth is. Now, an interesting question is whether any part of that conversation from a year ago about the need to diversify, does any part of that still survive? And I think if any part of that conversation does still have some salience, is that there was a conversation 12 months ago about how there was a difference between investing in a brand new plant in China to make things for the China market. And that was even a year ago a good idea and clearly is seen as even more of a good idea now. But then there was another question, which was, is China where you want to build the next state of the art plant to supply consumers in Europe or in the United States? And there, some of the concerns, not just about kind of dependence that we saw last year, some new concerns about, you know, whether you can be absolutely sure that there are no political risks 
associated with your China supply chain, perhaps if it runs through Xinjiang, uh, perhaps if you're using coal-fired electricity in a plant in China that is going to really interfere with your global promises as a European company to have a zero uh, net, zero carbon neutral global supply chain. Those conversations about being in China for China and then a separate conversation about whether China is the best place to manufacture for the rest of the world. I think some of those conversations uh, will endure. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you bring up Xinjiang because there's obviously a sort of moral side to the issue as well that, that becomes, I think, most, most emphasized looking at the situation right there. I mean, you've been to Xinjiang uh, recently. Is there, and what I was wondering is, is there any any way for uh, Western multinationals operating there or international companies more broadly to sort of audit their supply chains in Xinjiang and perhaps even in China more broadly to ensure that there's no forced labor whatsoever involved. So I guess one way to think about the challenge that a place like Xinjiang presents for foreign investors and in fact foreign governments too as they manage their relations with China is that Xinjiang poses us with a simple question and it poses us with a really complicated question. And the simple question is, how do you manage an unprecedented degree of economic interdependence and the idea that China is indispensable to solving all kinds of kind of big global challenges, whether it's kind of global warming or tackling future pandemics or you know stopping Iran from rebuilding its nuclear program. How do you manage your relationship with an indispensable China that in one corner of its territory in Xinjiang is behaving in ways that we in the West believe are wicked. How do you deal with a country that is at once indispensable and capable of acts of great wickedness? And I think you can see this in some of the kind of conversations we have about language. You know, any number of European parliaments have had debates about whether what is happening in Xinjiang is genocide. Uh, you've seen the American administration of, of Joe Biden uh, picking up the language about what is happening in Xinjiang being genocide from the Trump administration and saying, at least the Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, saying that that is his interpretation of what's happening there. There's an element of politics to that. There's an element of kind of, you know, getting tangled up in the world wordplay of what is genocide, what is not genocide. But I think that simple question lies at the heart of it, which is that most Western governments willing to look squarely at what is happening in Xinjiang recognize that if it's not genocide, it is certainly crimes against humanity and it's certainly wicked. It breaks every kind of norm uh, of how governments should behave that we thought we had kind of set in stone after World War II. What is happening in Xinjiang, particularly for Europeans, I think, looks much too close to what we saw happening in 1930s Europe uh, for comfort. Uh, that kind of ethno-nationalist, religious, uh, systematic discrimination uh, and desire to kind of eradicate or dilute the culture, that kind of coerced assimilation of an entire people uh, on the basis of ethnicity and religion is something that Europe has a real problem with because it reflects Europe's own original sin, the, you know, the Holocaust in, 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 in crude terms. And, and also some European colonial sins that, you know, whether you're Dutch or British or French or Belgian, you know, the very worst things that European colonial powers did in their former empires are very similar to what is happening in Xinjiang, which is basically best understood as a colony of Beijing uh, ruled with significant repression. So that's the simple question. And I don't think anyone has an answer to it because it's too expensive and inconvenient to, to work out what to do. So you have the extraordinary scenario that you have the Secretary of State of the United States saying that Xinjiang is an example of genocide, the most serious crime that you can accuse any government of. And then at some point, we wouldn't be surprised to see Xi Jinping visit Washington and sign a climate change pact with President Joe Biden and go into the Rose Garden and, you know, all wreathed in smiles. They've agreed some, you know, agreement to phase out coal fired electricity production or something that would make all the sense in the world in terms of the rest of their relationship. But we've never tried that before in modern history, you know, since the end of the Second World War, where the kind of the, the, the cry of never again led to the creation of the United Nations, 
uh, the creation of legal instruments defining something like genocide and outlawing it, we never imagined, I think, that Western democratic governments would find themselves having kind of detailed technical discussions with an indispensable partner and trade partner about things like climate change that at the same time we were accusing of at least crimes against humanity and possibly genocide. So that's the simple question that China poses, that Xinjiang poses. There's also a complicated question, which is if you're a company in, involved in China, can you be sure that your supply chain is completely free of things like forced labor that are unacceptable to a large enough proportion of your consumers in the West that you have to start making some big business decisions. So if you're Volkswagen, which gets, you know, something like half of its profits in China, I think, uh, and 40% of its revenues from China, and which has a joint venture plant in Xinjiang, largely because the Chinese government pushed all kinds of big companies to open plants in Xinjiang a few years ago, just for the development of the West. So Volkswagen has this plant in Xinjiang. Uh, it's a public relations uh, headache for them. If you're involved in things like cotton, it's a big problem. Clearly the supply chain, you know, there's lots of evidence of, of something that looks like kind of coerced labor uh, or non-voluntary labor. <coughs> European governments that are making very ambitious promises to increase their renewable energy uh, consumption and production. They can't do that without, among other things, solar panels from China. China absolutely dominates the world market in solar panels. A very large proportion of those solar panels, or at least the cells, the photoelectric cells, are made in Xinjiang. Uh, the basic raw material, quartz, uh, the polysilicate, comes from Xinjiang. Uh, the energy, the large amounts of electricity that you need to turn that rock into the wafer that turns into a solar panel uh, is is using cheap coal-fired uh, power from Xinjiang. So, you know, our kind of benign desire to have more solar electricity, uh, to have supply chains that, you know, uh, sell cars in China, they run up against the complicated question of what is really, really going on with labor in Xinjiang. One thing I would say is that the reason it's complicated is because sometimes uh, Western politicians, for example, they, they like to tell a simple story that all production in Xinjiang is tainted by the million people who are in labor camps or concentration camps. That's not actually what's going on. It's, it's harder than that. The million people, the million members of the Uyghur minority and other Muslim minorities who we believe have been through re-education camps in the last few years is a kind of total number, it's a guesstimate, not a terrible guesstimate, but it's a guesstimate of the total number of people who have been through re-education camps. But many of those kind of formal re-education camps have now been closed down, particularly the ones that are easy to see. And what seems to have happened, and I've seen this for myself on the streets of Xinjiang when I went most recently in December, you know, I went to a, a, a former re-education camp in the city of Khotan, um, which was you know, used as a propaganda tool of, you know, look at this re-education camp, it's actually teaching Xin, you know, Uyghurs to be uh, good citizens. That camp is closed. What appears to have happened is that a, a depressingly large number of Uyghurs have gone into the formal prison system, accused of kind of criminal acts, and then another very large number are being pushed through poverty alleviation programs and labor transfer schemes, basically designed to turn rural peasants into useful industrial workers, either in Xinjiang or by sending them in kind of large groups to factories on the coast of China. And that's the really complicated part, because it's not quite right to call those forced transfer schemes uh, re-education or labor camps or prison. It is at least in theory paid work, and at least in theory those workers are volunteers. The problem is that if you look at some of the Chinese government's own literature describing the need for these labor programs and these labor transfer programs, they do talk about them as a scheme to improve and modernize the thinking of backwards uh, Uyghurs who are prone to uh, being kind of led astray by religious fanatics and extremists. And there are recent government documents, a white paper produced by the Chinese State Council last year, which said in kind of so many terms that the fact that some Uyghurs continue to resist labor transfer schemes is proof that their thinking has been infected 
by terrorists and separatists and extremists who are trying to convince them that these labour transfer schemes are bad for them, that they should stay on the land. So that's a kind of real red flag that these so-called voluntary labour transfer schemes are clearly part of the same kind of desire to have coercive assimilation and a kind of gigantic social engineering programme to kind of remake the thinking of Uyghurs and turn them into biddable, disciplined, useful, industrial workers. And that is not genocide. That is not even a re-education camp. But if you're a Western company, a European company, and your supply chain includes factories run on that basis, that's really hard. And you asked a good question about the, the extent to which European companies can get their way out of this by setting in auditors. Well, one of the big problems is that China's desire to uh, control the news that comes out of Xinjiang extends to basically making it almost impossible for some of the big international auditing companies to send inspectors uh, to do their work in the way that they like to do with unannounced visits to factories and real access, unsupervised access to workers. And so as a result, some of the very largest global companies that provide auditing uh, of factories uh, and supply chains for multinationals have basically said they will not work in Xinjiang under these conditions. So if you're a Western multinational, it's a nightmare. And just if you thought it was not hard enough, companies like H&M, the Swedish fast fashion company, famously discovered a while ago that if you then say, well, as a result of all of these pressures, we're not sure that we should take cotton from Xinjiang because we can no longer be confident about what's in the supply chain, you then get a gigantic nationalist internet sort of storm whipped up against you by the Communist Youth League, picked up by private sector Chinese internet influencers trying to you know, gain more followers, and you find yourself the subject of a semi-state organised, semi-spontaneous consumer boycott because it's no longer enough for Chinese consumers uh, for you not to criticise China. They wanted foreign fashion houses to say that they liked Xinjiang cotton and that they want to use Xinjiang cotton. At the same time as you have activists in the West saying, don't you dare use Xinjiang cotton. So you can see that this kind of complicated kind of tangle of competing political demands uh, from your home market uh, is, 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 is an absolute nightmare uh, for Western companies that you know, can see all the growth in China uh, and all the consumers in China, but they also know that they have to avoid tainting their brand back home. Now, I, I do remember the images on Weibo of night shoes on fire. And I mean, I, I think if you're a business boss, it must leave quite the impression. Yeah, though what's, what's fascinating is that you can see that some things are more replaceable than others. So H&M makes t-shirts that you can, if you don't buy them from H&M, you can buy them from Uniqlo. And so, you know, probably H&M is still suffering. Nike, actually, their sales haven't done very badly uh, because it turns out that if you're a kind of fashion conscious Chinese youngster, there are Nike shoes that you really, really covet. And, you know, those Chinese kind of, you know, leaning shoes just do not quite match up. So there's an element of kind of uh, theatre to some of these boycotts. Well, to, I mean, I think there's a segue from the Xinjiang issue to the more sort of political relationship between uh, the EU and China, because I think that has changed since we last spoke. And it kind of characteristically exploded over Xinjiang because the EU, together with the US and the UK, put <coughs> sanctions on some Chinese officials, China retaliated, uh, against European elected officials, against the think tank Merricks in Berlin. And, um, well, as a result, now the Compre Comprehensive Agreement on Investments between the EU and China closed last year under the pressure, uh, well, enthusiasm of principally Germany, and uh, now seems to be in peril in the European Parliament. And there are many more examples of uh, European politicians at least taking a much more skeptical view of China. So as a European firm operating in China and having to deal with both these short and these long term strategies, how do you look at the political situation in Europe and does that change your calculus? So I think that, that you know, there are so many different threads in there that European companies uh, probably are worrying about. So, you know, it is true at the end of 2020, 
uh, we had this sudden flurry of diplomatic activity, as you say, really brokered by Angela Merkel with some support from uh, uh, President Macron in France uh, to uh, pass this this comprehensive investment agreement, which is not actually that important a trade deal. It's mostly a market access deal. Uh, it mostly favors a few German car companies, uh, a few insurance companies. Uh, and most of the reason that China was willing to sign off on that deal after you know dragging its feet for a very, very long time was related with the fact that this was December. Uh, they knew that Joe Biden had won the American election. He was not yet president. And they knew that some people in the Biden administration, the future Biden administration, wanted Europe to wait uh, and tackle China together in a kind of an alliance of democracies uh, to try and force China to change some of its uh, kind of ways. And you even saw the, the future National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, tweeting in public that Europe should wait. Uh, don't sign this deal just yet. Wait for us to take office. And so that gave China a gigantic political incentive to sign the deal quickly, to prove that it could divide the West, to prove that it could appeal to uh, the European desire for strategic autonomy uh, and that Europe could be divided effectively from the United States uh, when its economic interests were in play. Now, you're right that since then, after Europe imposed some fairly narrow sanctions on some Chinese officials uh, accused of abuses in Xinjiang, China retaliated with much, much broader, very, very sweeping sanctions uh, including against uh, members of the European Parliament from five of the six main political groups in the European Parliament. And on the face of it, that looks a very odd thing for China to do, or at least a very clumsy thing for China to do, because the European Parliament has to endorse the comprehensive agreement uh, with China. And so if you can't get uh, the CAI approved by the European Parliament, it isn't going to become European law. And it's quite clear that at the moment, the European Parliament uh, when five of their six main parties are under sanction, are not in the mood to even hold hearings. So you hear people saying, well, you know, why has China not realised the damage it's doing to itself? There's two answers to that, I think. One is that China was genuinely shocked by the Xinjiang sanctions. Uh, they noticed how serious they were too late. Uh, there was a flurry of pressure from the Chinese foreign ministry uh, to allies, the people they see as allies in the European Union, uh, above all Hungary, uh, somewhat Greece, uh, some other countries that are seen as kind of willing to block things on China's behalf. And they said to them, you know, can't you block this? How can you let these that go through? The problem was that they had misunderstood how Europe works. Actually, the deal had basically been done. Uh, it was too late to stop it. The sanctions were imposed. China then lashed out and imposed these sanctions. I am told by senior diplomats here in Beijing that when China imposed those very, very aggressive sanctions on Europe, it believed that Europe would unwind its Xinjiang sanctions uh, within a matter of weeks because Europe understood that its only hope of economic recovery after COVID lay in further, deeper commercial relations with China. The fact that China has made that politically impossible for now does look like a Chinese mistake. But if you're really cynical, and it's hard not to become really quite cynical here in Beijing, you worry that maybe the win for China was to show that Europe and America can be divided. And they got their win in December last year. And actually, there's not much in the comprehensive agreement on investment for Chinese companies because Europe's already really open. So, you know, European market opening is not a big uh, ambition for the Chinese. They already have lots of market access. Um, so maybe if this deal never happens or doesn't happen for many, many years, China doesn't care that much because it got its win on the day that it showed that it could divide the West and prevent an alliance uh, between Joe Biden and the Europeans taking shape. And as a European company, how do you look at this greater resistance within say, broadly the European political spectrum? I mean, even I think it was earlier this week that the, the Liberal Party in, in Germany, the FDP, scrapped the one China uh, policy, basically the reddest of red lines about Taiwan from its campaign platform. Um, you here in the Netherlands, three out of four coalition parties actually supported the motion to label what's happening in Xinjiang genocide. The only reason why the executive, the government itself, didn't uh, follow through on that is because the biggest governing party uh, was against that particular motion. So given this political resistance, it, how, how, how as a European country in long-term strategic planning do you take that into account? I think you need to be worrying about two different things. 
One is decisions that you can make as a company. So clearly, you know, uh, if a Chinese investor comes and wants to buy one of your technologies or comes to want to buy your company, uh, the politics of that kind of decision have changed really dramatically in the last few years. You know, the kind of deals that saw, uh, you know, Volvo uh, bought by Geely, the Chinese car company, I'm not sure how politically easy those would be now. Uh, or, you know, big biotech companies being bought up by Chinese investors, even kind of, you know, partnerships uh, with Chinese partners to develop sensitive technologies and things like biotech. I'm not sure that those are politically an easy sell now. And certainly as a European company, you are, you'll realize that the range of sectors that can be exposed to unpredictable political risks is growing. So you have to factor that in to all of your future investment decisions uh, because, you know, you know, you can be a food exporter selling, you know, herrings to China and you can think, you know, I am not going to be exposed to political risk. And then suddenly China says, actually, we found COVID traces on your herring jars. And so we're going to have, you know, nationalist publications in China accuse you of bringing in COVID to China on your herring. Now, it hasn't yet happened, I don't think, to Dutch herring makers, but it has happened to Iceland and Norwegian salmon producers. There was a while here in Beijing last year, you couldn't buy salmon uh, because, uh, you know, the state media was pumping out the idea that salmon was a vector for bringing COVID into China, which for which there is no scientific evidence. So, you know, turns out that salmon is a sector with political risk. Who knew? So those decisions for companies are becoming more complicated. I think the other thing that is going to really affect the way that companies uh, look at their relationship with China is related to what you were saying about parties in European governments and in parliaments being more willing to take very, very provocative lines uh, on China that are inevitably going to produce a response in China. That is because those parties are responding to public opinion. They can see the same opinion polls that European public opinion is much more sceptical of China, much more wary of China's rise, uh, perhaps willing to blame China for the cover up at the beginning of COVID, uh, perhaps wondering if therefore China is to blame in some way for the entire pandemic that is doing such damage to our economies and to our societies. In that context, European politicians are obliged to take a tougher line on China because uh, it is electorally rewarding to do so and electorally dangerous to be too pro China. And I think the Chinese government, because they don't really respect democratic mandates, because democracy isn't a system that they think uh, gives you any special kind of claim to uh, legitimacy, they are too quick to be kind of dismissive of public opinion. China basically thinks that because they are this unrivaled market where all the growth is, that politicians will say kind of, you know, dramatic things and march up and down and say they're going to be tough on China. And then in China's long experience, those same government ministers or sort of heads of government come to Beijing and behind closed doors with Chinese leaders say, you know, you know, I have to say that stuff, but actually let's, you know, sell you some aeroplanes or some cheese or, you know, whatever it is. There's an, there's an angle in that that really affects Western companies too, because the other part of those Western government ministers and government leaders coming to Beijing and behind closed doors saying, you know, don't pay too much attention to what I just said about human rights or the Dalai Lama, uh, because actually we want to sell you an Airbus. Western companies got very used to being extremely influential players, at least behind closed doors, uh, when it came to discussions about China. You know, they knew that politicians would come into office talking tough about China. And then if you're the CEO of a big Western company uh, that had lots and lots of workers and pays lots and lots of tax, you could get a meeting with your head of government or your minister and say, can you, you know, calm down, you know, make sure that you look after our interests because we're on the brink of, you know, selling China this or that. Uh, you need to really cool it. And those voices were extraordinarily influential for a very long time. And I think so if you're a Chinese, if it, sorry, if you're, if you're a Western company, you're not just worrying about the decisions that you can make. I think you should also be worrying about the dramatic uh, decline in your ability to lobby your own home government to go soft on China behind closed doors because your business interests are at stake. And I think 
That is one of the messages that we're seeing uh, government leaders delivering now increasingly in public to businesses that, you know, business interests remain fantastically important. Uh, there every, every Western government is desperate to uh, find a path out of COVID induced uh, recessions or slumps. And China is going to be part of that. But the days when a Western company uh, could, you know, basically buttonhole their prime minister or their president in private uh, to break China promises made on the on the election trail, that power is much less uh, potent than it was. Uh, ex that's extremely interesting. It will be very, very telling to see what kind of role China will play, if any, in the uh, upcoming elections in Germany. Um, maybe before we let you go, very brief question. What you hear a lot in Europe is we need China to cooperate with climate change as it's the largest emitter. Is there any evidence, whether it's competition with China over climate or cooperation over with China that we can actually influence Chinese, China's green policies? So in, at the margins, there is some evidence that actually European companies have considerable influence. So there's something uh, interesting that I'm looking to at the moment, that there are regions of China that are extremely keen uh, for further foreign investment, uh, particularly the, the, the so-called Chinese Rust Belt uh, in the northeastern provinces, uh, sort of up towards the border with Korea and with Russia. Um, they're already seeing kind of, you know, the kind of classic post-industrial decline. They get a lot of their energy from coal. Uh, they're kind of coal producing, steel producing, heavy industrial provinces. And they do have some very, very large European companies. So the largest Volkswagen plant, I think in the world, is in Shenyang, in Liaoning, in the northeast of China. Uh, you have a very big Michelin tire plant uh, in the same city, Shenyang. Uh, I am told uh, that those companies are, you know, among many, BMW, Mercedes, Michelin, all these companies that have made global promises uh, to have carbon neutral supply chains, uh, either right now or very soon. And they are saying to Chinese officials, we cannot expand our production if the only electricity that you can sell us is dirty electricity from coal. You are going to have to accelerate your energy transition if you want us to be able to stick around. And that gets them a hearing, not because they're the biggest employers in uh, the northeast of China, but because they're important and useful investors who bring the kind of advanced green technologies that China needs if it has any hope of making the ambitious targets set recently by Xi Jinping, the supreme leader, to make carbon as a, uh, the ambitious targets set recently by Xi Jinping, the Chinese leader, to make China uh, net carbon neutral by 2060. That can't be done without advanced technologies that European companies are really, really good at. And so that does give uh, European companies some surprising leverage at the margins. There are some bigger political problems, I think, facing European and Western governments in general, which is that one of the things that makes carbon, one of the things that makes climate change so hard politically is that governments mostly uh, believe that they have to tackle climate change, but they also know that the things they need to do to tackle climate change will be expensive and unpopular, at least in the short term. And so what they need to do is two things. They need to go to countries like China and say, you have to also take pain because we can't take pain if you don't, because we can't let you compete with us by being dirty when we're trying to be clean. That is not politically sustainable. The other thing that Western governments do, and we've seen this very, very clearly from President Joe Biden as he tries to make the case to the American public that it's a good idea and will not be very painful to tackle climate change. Western politicians have a habit of saying there is a competition to dominate the green jobs of the future, to be the champions of green technology. And we are going to beat China in that competition. We are going to roll out our clean green technologies and we are going to outcompete dirty Chinese technologies. And so as a result, Maybe coal miners and oil workers will lose their jobs, but they'll get new high paying union jobs installing solar panels or building windmills. You know, you hear Joe Biden more or less saying that in explicit terms. But the problem is that actually a lot of the fundamental technologies are not very advanced, things like wind turbines and solar panels. 
And China controls all of them. That China is just the dominant supplier of all of those things. So if you want China to really live up to its ambitious promises and to become green, and if you want to have you know, an affordable rollout of renewable energy, not just in China, but in the whole world, the jobs in many cases are probably going to be in China. So that's a real trap. I think there's a rhetorical trap that Western politicians have been setting for themselves, where they say, we are going to demand that China shows leadership and steps up and really tackles climate change in the same way that we are doing. And then in the next breath, they say, and it's not going to be as painful as you fear, because we are going to win the race to become a green technology champion in a kind of honourable competition with Chinese companies. And lots of those green jobs are going to be right here at home. Well, I think there's a real danger that you can't have both. That actually, if you really want China to, to go green, and if you really want China to show global leadership in terms of taking the pain of uh, tackling climate change, you're also going to have to let China remain utterly dominant in some core green technologies. You can't have the jobs and, uh, and have China show leadership. And I think that is a kind of rhetorical trap that Western governments have kind of slightly got themselves into at the moment. And, you know, one way that populist European governments, uh, if they get elected, could get out of that is to turn to something that looks a lot like green protectionism. And I think there are versions of things like the, uh, the border adjustment tariff that we're seeing in Europe, looking at the carbon content uh, of goods crossing the border into Europe. At the moment, European Union leaders are very clear that this is not protectionism. It's designed to create a kind of virtuous cycle where you give countries like China an incentive to go green so that they never get hit by these tariffs. But, you know, you could imagine more populist, less responsible governments getting elected that start to think that uh, slapping on tariffs at the border in the name of green kind of purity is actually a smart way to keep Chinese uh, goods at bay. And if you do that, I'm not sure that you also get the whole world to go green. So in, an, in, an, in, in some ways, we've come full circle. You know, the very beginning of this conversation was about how uh, we have never tried to be this economically independent uh, with a country that poses such a challenge to our political norms and values. Well, there's an economic side to that too. We've never tried to rely on a country like China to help us solve global problems. Uh, we've never had a child. There has never been a time in human history where some of the biggest problems facing humanity, whether it's global warming or pandemics, are cross-border problems. And that there is a country like China that is indispensable to solving those problems. But if China is really going to solve those problems, you have to allow China to rise in ways that will be unbelievably disruptive to our own economies. And we've never tried to pull off that trade off uh, in modern history. That's why China policy is so hard. Well, thank you, David, for being with us. Thank you.